Thank you, Jan. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We, we come to it again, Lord. And perhaps a passage that we're not overly familiar with and with some strange things to our ears. But we pray that you'll be with us, Lord, that you'll help, that you'll teach us what we should learn. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is indeed a, a strange passage to our ears, I think, Genesis chapter 20, but it's not alone in that, is it? it? It's very often the case in the Old Testament that you find a chapter and you could think of the one where uh, you get some of the sons of the prophets. You get isolated stories which pop up and they seem very disconnected to our modern world. Uh, and even very disconnected to the religious world of the Old Testament. And yet here we have fairly early on in the Bible, a story which, while seeming alien, uh, contains the man who is on his way, on a journey, uh, to becoming a father in the faith, to becoming uh, the one who brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so never, I think, in the Old Testament, did a passage seem in one way more strange and alien, and yet at the same time, closer to our own, as I hope we'll, we'll see in this brief look. Both this chapter and the one next week, uh, which I'm also doing, uh, Jack Genesis 21, they unfold in, in a wild uh, and unfettered time, in strange times. And we're not to think of Abraham as someone who's... Um, pass through Sunday school and ought to know better. There is always a temptation when we look at the Old Testament and just cast it as the church in the Old Testament, which it really isn't. There is always a temptation to look at someone like Abe and think, well, he, he ought to have known better. He's being inducted in the ways of a holy God, a God which is who has been forgotten since the time of Genesis. We don't exactly know the pathway to that uh, among the nations. We, we don't have many clues, certainly not in the Bible, as to that time between the beginning of the world and the time we're looking at now, uh, 2000 BC or so. But he's being inducted in the ways of a holy God, as we all must be when we come to the Lord. We don't understand uh, an iota of who he is, what he requires, and really however much we recognize our sin when we come to him as first as Christians, we scarcely realize how deep that sin is and how offensive it is to the holiness of God. And even now, years on, perhaps, we still get surprised by that recognition when the Lord lays it before us in his word. And as we go on, we realize more of the gap that lies between Jesus, who is a living exposition of the holiness of God and ourselves. If we want to see what holy looks like, we look at Jesus. And when we look at Jesus and we look at ourselves, we see that gap only, only too largely. And the book of Job, and we don't know when that was written either or, or quite when the time is, that features some of these elements. Uh, as you go through the book of Job, you get uh, mention of priests and mention of, of God in a kind of rather strange and, and vague way. And so we know that historically, even from the Bible, these wild times were so. And we see the result in them of falling away from Eden, falling away from the Garden of Eden and from holiness. We see tribalism. We see people living by their wits. And it's from this kind of society that Abraham is called out called out from Ur, and we know perhaps that it's Ur of the Chaldees, and you may know too that uh, Chaldea is synonymous with Babylon. This isn't the Babylon that we know about later on in, in the times of Daniel, say. Uh, this is far before that, but nevertheless, it is from that area that Abraham is called out. And to paraphrase a modern saying, um, you might be able to take the boy out of Babylon, but it's much harder to take Babylon out of the boy and that's what you see with Abraham as he goes on his background has to be cast off and so in chapter 19 as we saw last week there was lots failure to follow holiness even though we know that the New Testament says that 
by the grace of God, Lot is holy. He is an example in some ways. And yet most of what we know about Lot is an example not to be followed. It's the example of falling short and following one's own plan. And so we have last week Moab and Ammon, the um, eternal enemies of Israel, uh, being born. And in chapter 20, passage that Jan read for us, we're still in alien territory in this Jira. And we're living with the half truth that Sarah is uh, his sister. And note that it's Abimelech, the king of this area. We don't know how big the area is. These areas were often very small, but there seems to be some substance to it because he's able to offer land, isn't he? Note that it's Abimelech that God warns. It, God does give witness to the world, however unbelieving it is. And in some measure, even in this wild kind of area and time, Abimelech knows a little something. And it's to Abimelech that the warning is given. And so in verses four to seven, we get this interesting exchange. We get not Abraham, but we get Abimelech by the grace of God talking to God himself. And learning that had he have touched Sarah, had he have gone near her <coughs> in a physical way, that it would have meant death, not only for him, but for his tribe, for his people. And God is questioned by Abimelech over the death of the innocents, uh, death of the innocent. So, so you see, there's still some semblance of understanding God's morality. But remember that Abraham's journey will end in Jesus. And in Jesus, we see what it really means to be innocent. And not only that, we see what it means for the innocent to die for the guilty, the just for the unjust, as the Bible puts it. And then there is more theology in action in this chapter. Wild, wild though these events seem and far from anything that we could recognize as church, there is more theology in action. Abimelech it is made able to feel and to say that he doesn't want to take Sarah. He's in some sense pulled her aside and singled her out, but then he doesn't go any further. But we learn that it's only because God has purposed things to be that way. It's theology in action. Abimelech would be working what he would be thinking of as his own free will. He decided that he wouldn't touch her for reasons we're not really told. But God's sovereign will is working out through him, even though we don't suppose that he is a believer in the true God. It's what we call instrumentality in the theological world. God is working his purpose out, we sing. But sometimes we have a very limited understanding of what that means, what that might be. Abimelech may have questioned God, but... The Lord needs no reminders about how to be fair. It's the cry of children, isn't it? That's not fair, meaning I should have got a better hand in these things. Things should have been turned more in my direction. God needs no reminders about being truly fair, does he? He is, he is just. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, we read elsewhere. When we come to verse 7, and Abimelech is obviously now learning what he's learned from God, he's going to hand back Sarah. There's grand language. It depends what version you've got. Talks about Sarah being re returned, but the full weight of that word seems to mean to be restored in some way. And of course, he's, he's giving up all his kingly claims. This is an odd thing for a king to do because uh, you know, as we know, both in the past and in the, in the present all over the world, the king, the dictator, he has his way, but he gives up all kingly claim because in such a wild time, even as this, God's justice, God's holiness is not set aside. It might be a wild world we're looking at here, but God's standards of holiness were no different then. And of course, they're no different now by extension. The world that we live in is a world that seems to know nothing about these things. But that doesn't alter the fact that they are so. It doesn't change the fact that God 
requires utter holiness. Be holy as God is holy, we are told. Every opinion in our world is a philosophy of faithlessness, isn't it, really? People are incredulous. They are unbelieving that anyone would believe in a God who was active in this world. And it's even more so, it seems, as we go to the media. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ has come. And this holiness that we're talking about, he has lived out that standing in person in his life. And his word paints that in in glowing colours, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the beauty there, the words there. What a responsibility it gives to us knowing these things, knowing so much more than these people ever could or did. We learn in verse eight that Abimelech and his men, they're afraid. They know enough to fear. And you often see that in the Old Testament, even among those who don't know very much. You see it in the account of Jonah, don't you, with the sailors that they are persuaded, whether it's superstitiously or not, that there is a God, that something will happen. And they try and save Jonah, don't they? And the result of this is that in verses nine and ten, the pilgrim, that is Abraham, the man who is traveling through to a better land, to a holy land, he's reproved by an alien. He's told off, if we want to put it in modern terms, by a non-Christian. You've done things that ought not to have been done. Now, we excuse Abraham. He's on his journey. He doesn't yet know what he will know. But what a reproof that is for anybody who knows the word of God in their heart. You've done things that ought not to be done and worse said by someone who doesn't fully understand the ways of God, but knows enough to know that what you've done isn't right. It's an exposition of what we find in Romans chapter one and verse 20. That which can be known about God, his divine nature is clear. So even in that wild world, it was clear that God was holy and we sometimes think, as people are laughing about the idea of God, that we can't even get as far as beginning the gospel. And yet the scripture tells us that it can be known that God is divine and therefore he is holy. And what a reproof if a non-Christian should outdo us in virtue in that way. Um, Abraham's verse 11, Abraham's feeble half-truth that in fact Sarah is his sister, to save his neck. Uh, Note that it was a a passport that they used for the whole journey. That's quite clear from the way it's set out here. It was an agreement, and and Abraham had asked Sarah to do it as a kindness, and presumably as a kindness, she had agreed. And when we learn the reason why, or when Abimelech learns the reason why, they say, well, There was no fear of God in this land. We were just worried about what was going to happen. So we agreed on this passport beforehand that that she would be my sister. And even then, Abraham can't help himself. He says, she is kind of my sister. She's my half sister. And we recognize our own failings in that, don't we? Even as we apologize, sometimes we want to excuse. Uh, And clearly that's what Abraham's doing here, apologizing, but excusing at the same time. Uh, It's akin to one of those apologies that says, I'm sorry that you've been offended. We find it so hard to do these things well and properly, don't we? But it teaches us that there's no such thing as a hopeless mission field. Abraham imagined as he came into this land, wild that he thought it to be, no fear of God in the place. There was no, no point in talking about God, no point in talking about holiness. These things were far off. Well, we need to remember that it was in just such a world that the Lord Jesus Christ was born. It was in just such a time among the Romans, among the ideas of the Greeks, among the high minded but unrighteous Pharisees. It was in just such a time that the Lord Jesus Christ himself came into this world. No such thing as a mission field, as someone who is impossible for God to save. They've agreed to the plan out of love. We read in 
in verse 13. And yet Abimelech, it's him that exhibits a better example of kindness. God is holy, but he is also kind. Something that we sometimes as Christians can overlook. Some of the fiercer teachings about uh, judgment and sin and hell and deserving of death, true though they may be, and can often be issued in an unkind way and have been historically. But God is also kind. He is also merciful. And Deuteronomy describes him as loving kind. His kindness is linked to his love. They're welded together for the best of, of motives when we see God in action. And it's therefore doubly so for Christians that we ought to imagine that, examine our motives. Is it kind? Well, Abraham and Sarah are kind to themselves, but is it kind to someone else? Is it loving kind as God is loving kind? And so in verses 14 to 15 from Abimelech, we get the handing over of Sarah. We get sheep, oxen and slaves. No time to go into that issue today. And an invitation to settle. Go wherever you like in the land. The land is, is before you, he says, to Abraham. This may, in fact, be a temptation, of course, because we know that Abraham is seeking a country and we know that it's connected to land but not any land, the covenant land, the promised land. And this Jira, it's on the border of Israel, but it's also on the trade route to Egypt. And we know what Egypt means in the scriptures. We know what it stands for. We know the unfaithfulness and the temptation of Egypt. In verse 16, we get, and this might be a slight digression, but we get the Old Testament unfolding here in a way that shows God working within, in the understanding of the times. When God gave Abraham a covenant, whenever he restates that covenant, he's, he's operating within ancient Near East customs of the time. Some of the tab uh, tablets of the Assyrian kingdom uh, attest to these things so that promises were, were made and they were often linked with curses, with blessings and curses. And God follows that pattern. He follows the pattern of the times. So that, for example, in Deuteronomy 27, we get a restatement after a restatement of the law, we get the blessings and the curses. And there are 12 of them, 12 curses. And that's Abimelech's world, that's Abraham's world. And so what he's doing here Abimelech is that he's being careful to finalize the transaction he sees in some way that that sin has been done even though God has graciously protected him from the uh, full-on sin that he could have committed and so he wants to finalize the transaction and so as he hands over all these things for a wrong that he hasn't actually committed in modern eyes he's kind of ticking the box of the penalty clauses, if you will, of the covenant, of the agreement, of the agreement, perhaps in his mind, between a foreign king and the ancient uh, privilege and right of hospitality. He's realising that that came very near to be broken. And so he, he pays the penalty clauses for, for failing. It's not just a random a thousand shekels he hands over. Uh, he points out this is for Sarah, but it's to cover offence and to vindicate. Well, that's quite strange because actually what sin has been committed here? And yet this is, a, this is like a covenant. This is like an ancient legal agreement. It's being settled. It's being paid. There is no further debt. We're very quick in this country to point out bad law, aren't we? Oh, that won't work. Oh, that measure against uh, coronavirus, that won't work. Oh, what does the law really mean? And so on and so forth. How privileged we actually are to live under any kind of law, to live under things which aren't lawless, 
And here God has graciously, although Abraham thought otherwise, he didn't know what was going to happen in this place. God has graciously led Abraham and Sarah into a place where there's some measure of law. There's some measure of right, something left over. And we should never underestimate that when we're talking to people about God. We should never underestimate that Romans tells us quite clearly and conscious, conscience tells us that there is usually some area that we can tap, some thought, some thought patterns which are not entirely lawless, but how grateful we should be that we live in a lawful country. And then in verse 17 to 18, finally, after all this strangeness, grace appears in a recognisable form. There's a prayer meeting. Whew. After all this strangeness in a foreign land, Abraham finally gets around to praying. And there's what we might say is a prayer meeting. And Abraham, in verse 18, prays. And we learn that the land has barrenness. Now, it's quite hard to work out that because you, if you ask the question, well, when? Because if you think of the way that this seems to unfold, you know, that you're almost looking at one day and one night, you think. And yet, how would it be known in one day and one night that the whole land had become barren? Most people would never define out, would they? They'd never discover. It seems that God has actually set this up. Uh, I'm, I would suggest that maybe the land had been barren for a while, that God had prepared a whole tapestry, a whole, a whole area of his activity for these things to fall into, a whole pattern, so that when Abraham and Sarah got there, the land was already barren, and many people knew it. And God is working his purpose out. Another example, we might say, well, that seems dreadfully unfair. God is never unfair. He's always loving. He's always kind. And he always has a pattern in mind. Anyway, Abraham is the true servant, though we note that he's no better and in some cases worse than Abimelech, enlisted into God's service. And we learn, of course, in the New Testament that it's by grace, through faith, and even that, not our own. And that was Abraham's case, wasn't it? He was the father of the faith. He is the father of the faith. And now he's back praying. He's back keeping covenant once again. He prays. And what's the outcome? The outcome, in a word, is life. And that's the God we're dealing with. There might have been barrenness. But what's the barrenness for? It's to demonstrate life. What's the barrenness in this world for? It's that the Lord Jesus Christ might, by his spirit, breathe life. Think of the dry bones in the valley in Ezekiel 37. Can these bones live? God knew the answer to that question. And they stood up and they lived and they breathed. And so it is with, with the gospel that we go to a wild place, an untutored, uncharted place in some measure. We thank God for the common grace and the law that exists. But we should never think that the mission field is barren. There is goodness even among what Abraham finds there. There is Abimelech's goodness. The kings of the earth, as we know from Psalm 2, they're set to oppose these things. And so often the law of the land and the presidents and the dictators, they either oppose indirectly or some, in some cases very directly the word of God and the exercise of it and the spread of it in their land. And yet we still live in relative freedom, don't we, in this land? We still live in freedom to do what we're doing today. Today and to declare that Jesus saves, he saves from all of it, all that kind of thing that we're looking at, all that muddle, all that half-truth, all that self-promotion. Jesus saves from all of it. He fulfills the covenant and the curses. We have a sovereign Lord, and he's there at the beginning of the event, and he's there at the end. He fulfills the covenant and the curse. He's the Alpha and the Omega. 
His ways are often beyond knowing. Abraham certainly was had a lot to find out. And yet, and yet they're always kind. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this disordered, orderly world, he set his face, didn't he, to come. And what did he find as he got nearer the cross? He found betrayal. He found mock trials. He found a, a crowd that were willing to shift from one person to another, from Barabbas, from him to Barabbas in, in the twinkling of an eye. And in the cross, all that came together. All that filth of the world, all that uncertainty, all that heart, all those half measures, all that double dealing. That all came together on the cross and the events that surround the cross actually picture it, don't they? They picture that kind of world of truth, half truth, confusion, self-promotion, plotting. It's all there. And it's all part of what Jesus took and nailed to the cross. He took the curse of sin and he nailed it to the cross to produce a world which Abraham himself wouldn't live to see but to produce a world in which Christians ought to live and breathe, a word, world in which there is holiness or the possibility of it. There is the Lord's word clearly given to us uh, and there is grace and grace again on the basis of that cross. So for the Christian, what lies ahead? Not uncertainty as with Abraham, but only the kingdom, only the covenant as God saw it as the cross sealed it the future is his the future is the lord's we've been through a crisis and we're still in one uh, we think but the future has always been the lord's it's all in his hand and in this passage uh, we see that in such contrasting and yet sharp ways may the lord bless our understanding of it as we think more about it amen let's have a prayer together and then uh, I have to leave you and there will be a song following on from that which is a, a modern setting of an old 18th century and steel hymn uh, dear refuge of my weary soul but let's just close with a moment in prayer and then I'll depart heavenly father we thank you for your word we thank you lord that though we live in such a strange and alien world we live in a world where the lord jesus christ has been made known where we know more than Abraham did through your grace and through your help. And we have uh, the potential to uh, live in a way where your word is ever before us and in our hearts. Forgive us for our sin, Lord, we pray. Help us to look clearly and brightly upon any mission field and to the future, which is all in your hand. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.